Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell. On the line with me today is returning guest to the program and my good friend, David Skarika. David is the editor, publisher of addictedtoprofits.net. David, thanks for coming back on the program with us today. It's good to be here. All right. Well, I, I think today is a good day to talk. Uh, you follow the markets more closely than most people that I know. Uh, starting off yesterday, which would have been Wednesday, May 13th, we started to see uh, what could be the end of the bear market rally. And uh, today, the price action's up and down. Uh, I want to get start off by getting your opinion on where we're at in uh, the stock market, the general equities. Well, in terms of ending the rally, I do think we're near the end. I was looking at that 2,900 to 3,000 level, you know, because 3,000 is kind of psychological on the S&P, and we almost got to 3,000 a week or two ago. And, and if you look at the history of these bear market rallies, though, you get usually the first month is when the majority of the actual gain happens, but then the market usually takes a number of months to top out. So I think we're in that phase now. And actually, a technical chart, if we look at past historical markets, the most similar market, I know a lot of people are throwing around that 29 chart, is it's actually not that. It's actually the Nikkei in 1990, especially because that time frame where the Nikkei actually tanked in March, April, kind of like we did, and then it rallied into May, and then it topped out into the summer, then slowly began to roll over into like July, August, and then really tanked that fall, and the Nikkei was almost 50% off its highs by the time it bottomed October of that year for another good bear market rally started. So. I kind of think we're in that situation now. Now, what makes this different from, say, the Nikkei 1990 or, or the Dow in 29 is the amount of stimulus they've done here. But one of the arguments always against, against the, what the Japanese did or what the Americans did in 29 was people always say, oh, they didn't add enough liquidity, right? They, the, the Fed wasn't quick enough to cut. The Fed let all these banks fail in the 30s. Yeah, same thing that Japan didn't. I don't even think they really started cutting rates to late 1990 or 1991. And you are really behind the curve. So now, of course, we're already at zero. We're doing all the stimulus. But, of course, the initial downturn is much worse. Like in terms of the actual economic decline, that really didn't start till 31 in the in the Great Recession or Great Depression. Sorry. Uh, an unemployment rate was still 8 percent in 1930. So um, now we're seeing kind of the unemployment upfront loaded because of what's ha- up front loaded because of what's happening with covid so um, uh, i think you know it, it's uh, nothing's ever going to be exactly the same but i think the actual market action is the same and I'll remember a lot of this rally is in these kind of large tech stocks or companies that are benefiting from you know kind of the reshaping of the economy in this lockdown period people watching netflix or having to order everything on amazon or having to go to walmart all the time you know, having to order food because they can go to restaurants. So you're seeing those companies that benefit from that act well. But remember, none of those companies, Amazon and Netflix, none of these companies are cheap companies, right? They're all very expensive. They're all companies that, you know, Netflix has 194 billion market cap and uh, makes $1 a share. And the uh, stock is $450. So all of these companies are kind of expensive. And I think that in the next leg down is then when they get hit, as well. And also, I saw an interesting stat that the last time we had all these mega cap companies make up a huge portion of the S&P 500 is when all the tech stocks, that being back then was Microsoft, AOL, uh, Cisco, Oracle, et cetera. That it was 99, 2000. Well, now these kind of like eight big stocks in the S&P 500, Microsoft being one of them again, Apple, Amazon, et cetera. These stocks make up a bigger percentage of the market than they ever have before, even in 2000. So that's a sign that the market's very top heavy. And then all these famous investors like, you know, Stanley Drunkenmiller or Paul Tudor Jones, they're all warning about another leg down in the equity markets. And I really think, again, with that setup of, of the similar trading to the Nikkei, of the valuation. And then the last thing is just the delusion of people thinking that this is going to be a V-shaped recovery, that you're going to lock yourself into your house for four months and everything's going to be normal. You get out. I think that is completely delusional, and that's what's actually holding up the market. You know, because you know you got Trump talking about how the fourth quarter this year and the first quarter next year are going to be great, and I, I personally don't think that's going to happen. I think that this is a a generational shift where people are going to change their spending habits, their behavior in terms of uh, you know how they look at money, finance, etc. And that kind of happened in the 30s, and I think that's going to happen. And and when we see that happen. 
at the best we'll get a W recovery and probably more likely we'll get a form of an L-shaped recovery, meaning that, you know, once ever the unemployment rate tops out, whatever it's going to be, 25 percent, et cetera, you know, maybe it'll go back down to 20 or 18 when things open up more. But it's not going to be like it was. And the fact that this made the unemployment rate do this, I'm sorry, you're in a depression. You're not in a recession. This didn't happen in 1918. This didn't happen in past uh, that, that, you know, other pan- pandemics that happened in the 50s and 60s or even SARS or, or, the, or, or the whatnot. This is obviously something much drastically uh, different is happening right now. You know, accommodation by the Fed clearly been what's been propping this market up, not just since the crash, but before the crash. I was listening to some pundit a couple days ago. I don't remember who it was, but they were kind of a bit negative on gold. Not not that it would crash or anything, but they, they said, you know, the Fed's already thrown everything it has at the at the market. And I couldn't help but thinking, what is this person talking about? Even today, you've got the market had crashed one day yesterday. And the Fed's coming out saying we need to accommodate further. The Democrats are putting together, or they've already put together a $3 trillion bill. At at some point, the fact they're throwing everything at this and they can continue throwing it is not going to have an effect. But it certainly seems to to be continuing to have an effect right now. Well, I I don't think, when people say the Fed is out of bullets because rates are zero, I completely disagree with that. They can go negative rates right now. They're resisting that because that's really detrimental to the banking sector. You know, they can up QE. They, you know, they're buying corporate bonds now. They can buy stock ETFs. They could start just printing money and doing MMT, you know, printing money, putting it into everyone's bank account. And they could print money to bail out the states and the municipalities. And as long as rates are low and the U.S. dollar remains relatively firm. And see, and that's another point is I think one reason they can be so aggressive is because the U.S. is the reserve currency of the world. It, probably the dollar would be soaring due to uh, liquidity problems if they're not being so aggressive. So that kind of dollar holding up gives them a lot of leeway. Like I saw that Spain, for example, is they were talking about it's gonna, they're going to run a 10 percent deficit you know, as a percentage of GDP. Well, the U.S. is going to run like a 30 percent deficit. People are going crazy about Spain doing this, but no one cares that the U.S. is doing it because, again, they have this kind of reserve currency. So I I disagree. They're going to get much more aggressive. And see, I'm kind of on both ends of the deflation inflation debate where I think right now, because there's still going to be insolvencies, there's still going to be bankruptcies, there's going to be downgrades of investment grade companies going to junk, and the Fed can't really stop that. So that's when we get this kind of next form of the deflation trade, in my opinion. And then after that, though, again, I think the response will be even more aggressive than what we're seeing now. So then we get the inflation out of that. So I think these people are just hyperinflationists, like Peter Schiff, are wrong in the next 12 months. But I also think the people that are big time deflationists, like, say, Mich- Shedlock, they're wrong over the next three to five years because the response is going to be so aggressive to this uh, coming out of this. So, and there's going to be like, I do think on the geopolitical front and usually, you know, I'm that one who gets into politics, but when you're thinking about supply chains moving away from China, et cetera, this is going to cause disruptions, uh, increased costs at some point, uh, uh, you know, in goods and services after this kind of deflationary bust. But I think we need this kind of deflationary bust first because you know, people are living in homes they can't afford. They have car loans they can't afford. And when that those kind of get defaulted on, all of a sudden you'll have this excess surplus of things like cars and homes, et cetera. And that will weigh on prices for the short term. But again, I think the way out of that is just going to be to print so much money. And they're going to and they're already being so much more aggressive than the U.S. in the 30s, than Japan in the 90s. That is when inflation takes off. But by the way, so let's get back to gold. You were talking about gold selling off. Well, gold is up. By the way, gold, you know, even though it was, you know, the price was uh, linked, gold went up in the 30s, right? Went from 20 to $35 an ounce. And just, and by the way, the, one of the best ever decades for gold miners was in the 1930s. It wasn't the 70s, it wasn't the 2000s, it was the 30s. And why was that? Because the gold price went up 75% overnight and their costs were basically fixed because of the deflation. Oil prices were low, there was no wage pressure because of the Great Depression. We're kind of in that scenario now, even if there's not a lot of inflation in the short term, big input costs is oil and oil is now dirt cheap and gasoline is dirt cheap for gold companies. There's going to be no minor strikes. People are going to be happy to have a job. 
with you know 20% unemployment. So there's gonna be no wage pressure in the short term. So right now the miners are set up to have this great combination of cost inputs going down. And if people kind of go to gold in a flight to quality uh, because of these governments bankrupt themselves and the, the economy remaining uh, weak, to me, it's almost the best of both worlds. All you really need is the, the miners because of COVID. Mining is a difficult profession because guys are close to each other, especially in the underground vein mines. So that's the issue. Some of the miners have had to shut down some operations. But once these guys can get operating with all those input costs going down, I think you're going to see a huge jump in profits and in margins. And by the way, the gold miners will still do good during inflation. But actually, and ironically, in a way, this kind of deflationary bust is almost just as good for them because the input costs are going up at a time that what they make goes going down at the time of what they make, e.g. Uh, gold and precious metals, is going up. And the analogy I'll use is this. Why has Apple done so well in the last 20 years? Because they moved everything to China, their operations. So the cost of operations went down. And yuppies in North America and Europe will pay $1,000 for an iPhone. So they had costs going down and uh, the amount of money they could sell for their main product, that being an iPhone, going up. Perfect uh, scenario. Well, that's now going to happen to the miners. Yeah, for sure. I would add one thing to that. Apple makes the best phone a lot that that is out there. I know you're not an Apple product person, but I, no, no, <laughs> I, I, I'll do everything but the phones. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, that's good. That's a change I'll, coming. I'll do the computers and uh, but I, I um, part of the reason is I, if I forget my passcode, Apple makes it like you got to be Elon Musk or something. To, to remember your passcode and change it and goes on your other and I'm, Android and Google's way simpler that way. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Okay. So let's go back to gold a second. Gold stocks. People can move to gold stocks purely out of fear. You just brought that up, but set that aside. Bull markets are a consequence of more investors moving into a trade. And what's so fascinating about the situation unfolding right now is you have a situation where generalist investors in huge numbers could quite potentially start moving to gold. You've got a sector that just put out tremendous cash flow almost across the board. You've got the only sector that's broken out from pre-COVID highs. So you have generalist investors who maybe have never even thought of the word gold that are now going to be forced to buy them because they're the only set of stocks that are producing dividends. And then on top of that, you have a situation where not just the input costs of mining lower, like oil, gas, which goes in diesel, uh, which goes into these mining operations, you've got the actual product that they're producing going up. And as you and I think, probably going up even more. This is, I wake up every morning thinking the most unbelievable situation for gold investors. Yeah. Like again, to get back to those costs, if you go look at the, when that gold bull market started in the early 2000s, the South African miners went ga gangbusters. A lot of them went to uh, share prices they had never returned to. And why was that? Because the South, the RAND collapsed, but all their costs were in RAND and gold went up, you know, whatever, from 250 to 400 in US dollars. But in RAND, it like went up 5X. So we're kind of seeing that in the whole gold market now where the costs are fixed. And if gold goes to 2,000, 2,500, that's going right to the bottom line. And here's the thing about investors. There's, it, there's a, hu a huge sl slew of retail investors coming to the market now. Part of the reason is people are sitting around their houses with nothing to do, and there's no sports to bet on, there's not, you know, et cetera, and they're trading stocks. But if you go look at the Robin Hood num numbers, people are still trying to get into the airline stocks, the big tech stocks, et cetera. So I really think when you will really see that influx of retail investors is if I'm right in the second half of this year into early next year, you see this uh, second leg down in the equity markets and the gold and gold stocks are the best performing sector, that is when these individuals will go in. And the small retail guy who say maybe speculated in crypto, speculated in weed stocks, you know, all these volatile sectors, the junior mining sector is perfect for the small retail guy because it's got the volatility of those two sectors and that's what attracts the small retail guy. So I think there's a perfect storm created. I think maybe they're slowly getting in, but the stats are still showing they're trying to chase those stocks that I talked about, like, you know, the Netflixes, the Amazons, the Zooms, the stuff that's benefited from everyone being locked in their houses. But I think the next phase, when people see the kind of economic consequences to all this printed money, all these huge deficits, probably this kind of consumer boom that we've gone through really for 35 plus years, kind of coming to an end. I think that is when the gold and precious metal equities will really, really benefit from that. So I would say 
we still have another six to probably nine month window to, I, I can still consider the gold equities relatively cheap here to buy these things relatively cheap. But I think after that is when they'll kind of be the only game in town and you'll really see the mainstream masses get into them. I feel that the best indicator for when we should start selling gold stocks is going to be looking at the retail investor through the Robinhood platform. Two, two ones to point out, which I know you're aware of at least one of, but a couple weeks ago, something like 150,000 of the 10 million Robinhood accounts were pouring into that oil ETF. So the funny thing about that is not only do those kind of investors chase something like Aurora Cannabis when it's peaking out, but then when things drop, and then start to plateau, they think that these things are going to go back up and then they drop even more. So the other case that I just found out about yesterday, the Jets airline ETF, one would think that the group that owns the Jets ETF is doing really poorly. They've actually had 20,000 new Robinhood accounts buy into that. They've had massive inflows. And then look what's happening to, to the airline stocks the last couple of days right well, after that. Actually, the group that owns that, and I kind of goof on, I know he's on the board of one of your companies, so I won't be too hard on him on Frank Holmes sometimes because I got bearish on the uh, on the on the airlines about five six years ago, and I say when a mining guy gets into you know airline stocks, that's the top, and it took a few years to top out, but now you know Jet, Jets is down 50, 60 percent, but he just has they just have the management company, they have a 0.6 percent expense ratio, they have 615 million. In assets, because you know money is pouring in, because people even if they're not long term, they want to trade it. So if that gets up, even if the jet CTF falls another 50, 60 percent, which I think it will, he could have a billion dollars in assets, and 0.6 percent means you're making six million dollars a year off the fee. And I'd be fine with something falling 80 percent if the, my fee went up 10x. That, you know, that's that, that's actually a great deal, you know, so um, which actually shows you if you come up with a creative, you know, uh, a way to play a sector, you can make money from it. Because like I said, like the airlines are going to be one of the poorest performing sectors, probably, you know, from when they topped early this year for the next like uh, year or so. You know, many of them are going to fall 80, 90 percent. Many are going to go bankrupt. But an, an ETF like that, actually, if you're just managing it. You're going to do fantastically in your fee. So, but but, but you're right. By the way, the, after Buffett said he sold his um, airlines, retail investors that was one of the biggest sectors they were buying. You know, the few days later, which is kind of funny that one of the most successful investors ever would sell his airline, you know, sell his stocks and airline stocks, and then the average Joe Schmo is trying to bottom feed in them. And just so you know, with the airlines. I'm a max, you know, I like John Templeton and I like, it's a, I call it maximum pessimism. That's what he used to call it. I believe many of these airlines, because the government already has a vested interest by, you know, putting equity stakes into them, the government's going to bail them out again, but when they go down again and probably dilute them even more. But I think that when these are single digit stocks, like when Delta, American, you know, uh, Southwest, whatever it may be, are trading at two, three dollars. They're going to be great buys for quick five to ten x kind of moves higher. Very similar to what happened in the casino stocks in two thousand nine. For sure. All right. Well, let, let's start to close up here. Back to where we started. A concise overview. Where are we at in the markets now? Is this rally that's unfolded since the crash going to continue, level off, or start to crater soon? Well, I think it's either leveling off or continuing in the short term. I do think we hit the top, so I'll say level off. That probably between whatever, 2,800, 2,700, and 3,000 will kind of continue to top out. Because remember, like you talked about the Democratic uh, uh, stimulus package. That package doesn't look like it's going to get passed, but probably some watered down form of it will, which will still be another one, two trillion. So they'll keep doing all this stimulus. And I think, and also the hope that everything will be normal as you know things open up. And by the way, the opening up we know is a scam because you got to go to restaurants with masks and gloves and sit between like pillars and stuff like that. So it's not really opening up. It's just there's a weird kind of new world we're going to be in for the short term. But, and I mean the next 12 months or so. So I think when people realize this opening up is pretty horrible and not really going to see much of a rebound, that's when it rolls over. And I'm really looking at the second half of the year. And that, and that combined with the fact that a lot of times these pandemics are seasonal and they go along with flu season. And you know, flu season tends to pick up in September, October. And even if we've hit the peak amount of cases now and it comes back, 
I don't know, a quarter of half of what it is now, that is just going to tank the economy again in the third or fourth quarter. And again, that kind of leads into my them doing even more stimulus in the goal taking off, et cetera. So uh, I think right now we're topping out and you have the next few months if you want to short to get into some of the short positions, take some of your longs off the table, you know, uh, maybe continue to buy some PMs. And then I think the second half of this year into the first half of next year could get pretty ugly uh, for equity markets. All right. Well, David, thanks for coming back on the program. Anybody interested in getting in touch with David, go to addictedtoprofits.net. David puts out some of the best content, market content on both precious metals and the overall equities and always interested in his commentary and opinions. Thanks for coming on, David. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bit. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, It could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?